from the High Definition Production Center of Troy University's Broadcast and Digital Network and Troy campuses around the world, this is Troy Trojan Vision Weekly. Hello and welcome to Troy Trojan Vision Weekly. We're glad you joined us for this look at what's happening in and around Troy University. I'm your host, Aaron Taylor. Well, some Alabama senators can now claim to have a better understanding of Chinese language and culture thanks to Troy University's Confucius Institute. Joshua Lee explains how. For two weeks, a delegation of Alabama government and business leaders toured China with Troy University's Confucius Institute in an effort to learn more about Chinese business and culture. There's certainly a, a relationship we already have in Southeast Alabama with the people of China, and that is with those students that are coming to uh, Troy University for their education. And uh, I, I think that they, like us, look for peace and prosperity. And I, I think that the trips like this would give an introduction to having a keener understanding of the differences, but also the similarities. We have so much in common between China and the United States, and it's been a benefit to everybody on this trip to, uh, to try to make it work better. And the culture just continues to amaze all of us. So many people, and they, they're so nice, but yet they're organized and they're going about their daily life, and so it's a good trip. Members of the delegation feel that this cultural exchange will educate leaders on both sides. I think as far as we in the United States are concerned, and especially Alabama, we almost totally do not understand them. Uh, they've got very little understanding of a lot of our concepts and things, so just us being able to uh, come here, experience their life, uh, look at some of their uh, customs, uh, it's, it's got to uh, enhance our relationship with each other. Stops on the trip included sites such as the Great Wall and Tiananmen Square, places that many of the delegates might never have gotten to see otherwise. It's been great, you know, things that I probably never would have been able to see, you know, the Great Wall and Tiananmen Square and, and uh, the other things that we have on our schedule this week. You know, it's been uh, such a pleasure to see the, the sights of China, uh, the things I never would have seen in my lifetime probably. Joshua Lee, Troy, Trojan Vision News. Holocaust survivor Ann Rosenheck was at Troy University last week giving a lecture to students about her experiences during the Holocaust. Samantha Charles has the story of her return to Troy. Ann Rosenheck, a Holocaust survivor, visited Troy University as a part of the school's week of Holocaust remembrance. Rosenheck shared her experiences in a series of workshops and lectures on campus. I still I'm getting cold, and I still want the world should know what really happened. So that's why I'm still trying to speak. 8,000 Jews were killed. So many Christians were killed as well. You have no idea in the thousands, and pl plus many others. Hitler's way is unreal. Rosen Heck was once too ashamed to tell her story, but now she shares her personal experiences with the world in hopes of educating people on the horrors of the Holocaust. I didn't want, I wanted that people should know where, who I am and where I come from and that I was a, from a Holocaust. What? So I didn't, I didn't want to talk. As the time came, I didn't want to to tell, not show. I wanted to hide it. But for a spell I did, but then I didn't. I couldn't because it bothered me that people were talking differently. And I says, yes, it isn't the right way. This was Rosen Heck's third lecture at Troy University. And one teacher in attendance tells us what she hopes her students learned from this experience. I am hoping that they see just a face with the story. Um, so many times when we study history, history is just books. And books can be so dry, and I wanted them to see that it's alive and it's real and it's, um, it's a person who was a kid who, you know, I wanted them to see the truth of it. Drive sober, get pulled over. Arrive alive, don't text and drive. Both are phrases we hear on television commercials and seeing ads, but how much that message really sinks in? 
The Arrive Alive tour was on campus on Monday with the same message, sharing it in an interactive and hopefully more memorable way. Sarah Singletary has more. A rainy Monday morning took a turn for the worst here at Troy University with several vehicular manslaughters and head on collisions. The location of these accidents, a driving simulation on the social quad. The Arrive Alive tour made a pit stop on campus to show students the real life consequences of driving drunk or while texting. I think it, I think texting and driving can be kind of people do it and they don't really notice that it's bad until they like have a wreck or to hear of someone dying or something. One student shares not only what she learned from the simulation, but what she hopes other students take from it as well. I would tell them to not do it, of course, because that was a major fail. I cannot pull up my text messages and drive at the same time I hit two people. <laughs> but I'll also tell them come try it because they also have drunk driving. So, I mean, it's normal stuff that college kids go through drunk driving and texting and trying to be superheroes and we cannot so just don't do it. <laughs> the Arrive Alive tour gives similar presentations at college campuses, high schools, community events and military bases. An Arrive Alive simulation technician shares why they go where they go and do what they do. Well it's just kind of an epidemic right now with all the uh, I mean every five cars I see on the road is somebody on their phone. And everybody thinks drunk driving is more dangerous when really, like today, there's going to be 11 teens that died from just texting and driving. And that's the kind of message we're trying to get across is, you know, it's really easy to avoid and you don't have to and it's just not worth it. For more on the Arrive Alive campaign, visit ArrivalLiveTour.com. Sarah Singletary, Troy, Trojan Vision News. And that Arrive Alive Jeep you saw in the story was up for grabs for anyone who could complete the simulation without making any errors. Organizers say they've never had anyone succeed. Well, in preparation for the final home game of the season, the Trojan football team held a day of appreciation for all the Troy University students on Thursday on the Bib Graves quad. Samantha Charles has the details. With the semester coming to a close and the last home football game around the corner, Troy Student Involvement wanted to show their appreciation for students by letting them kick back with the Troy football team. Student appreciation, we're just giving back to the students. They've done a good job. Of, actually, they've done an awesome job of coming to the game, staying for all fourth quarter, four quarters, which is what we've been trying to get them to do over the years. And the students have been awesome this year, so we're just showing our appreciation back to them, giving away free pizzas. We wouldn't have a football team if it wasn't for the fans. You know, uh, we wouldn't have anybody at our games, you know, and with the crowd behind us, it, it, it's to change the momentum of the game, actually. You know, when things are going good, the fans are behind us and supporting us to make us keep on pushing on doing what we're doing. And uh, even when the, we're doing bad, the fans help us get back on our feet to help us, you know, generate that, that power on the field. Coach Neil Brown and the Troy football team showed appreciation to their biggest fans. You, the students of Troy University. At the meet and greet, students got to meet their favorite players and share a slice of pizza. Uh, we're just sitting out here uh, trying to get, you know, the fellow students to uh, come and join us for pizza, you know, mainly for, you know, most people are hungry at lunchtime. And we want them to come out and join us this weekend versus Georgia Southern because it's senior night. We want them, uh, the whole body, to be uh, one. Although they may seem like local celebrities, Smith wants fans to know that the football players are no different than the average student. Well, first of all, the, the, the students um, and, and the football players, the, the football players are students also. So you want to build that relationship with them and, and the students so they won't just feel a separate bond between each other. The students over here and the football players here, but all of them are students and they, you know, they need to interact with each other anyway. Samantha Charles, Troy, Trojan Vision News. We're going to take a short break, but when we return, we'll look at some of the ways Troy University celebrated our nation's veterans and activities on campus this week. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. The warrior spirit, it's in there, always has been. Now let it out and take the world by fire. Train well and learn what it means to be a Troy Trojan. Walk with confidence, conquer, claim territory and climb ladders. Know that you have the power to stand alone, but the comfort of knowing that you'll never have to. Discover your inner warrior. Find it at troy.edu slash spirit. You sure you don't want some? It's chamomile. <laughs> 
person. You are extremely terrifying. Just the scariest undead subhuman thing on TV, and I really mean that. <laughs> but I am worried that you could give my kids nightmares if they see you, so I'm going to have to block you. <laughs> so that's it. Oh, and, and tell the zombies they're, they're blocked too. <laughs> Now back to Troy Trojan Vision News Weekly. Here's a bit of Troy trivia for you. The person who piloted the fastest flight ever across the U.S., well, he's a Troy alumnus. And that record-breaking pilot, Lieutenant Colonel Ed Yielding, spoke on campus to students last week. Sarah Singletary has the story. In 1990, a Troy Trojan made a record-breaking flight that made him a living legend. That very Trojan was back on campus Friday morning. Air Force pilot Ed Yielding made a trip back to his alma mater to share his story with the community. Uh, I'm just uh, really looking forward to being here at, at Troy University and I appreciate, I appreciate so much all the hospitality and seeing the campus. The campus is really beautiful, really seeing the beautiful campus and the friendliness and the hospitality of the, the people here. After flying the SR-71 aircraft for six years, Yielding has learned the ins and outs of the plane. Yielding shares one fact about the aircraft that may come as a surprise. Well, I think possibly they don't know that it's over 50 years old now and it still looks futuristic. It's a beautiful airplane. And I'm sure a lot of people are surprised to know that it's that old. Yielding set the official coast-to-coast -coast aircraft speed record in the fastest and highest flying plane of its time. Although the Blackbird is now retired after 25 years of service, 25 years later, its record still stands. Well, it is uh, surprising, and I look forward to that record being broken, you know, because uh, I'd like to see advances in airplanes and speed. And, and we have made a lot of advances, and one of the advances in, is it has been in stealth, and that's really the reason we haven't had a faster plane. Because of stealth, we haven't needed the speed like we did in the Cold War years. And we'll hear more from Yielding about his record-breaking flight later in the show on this week's edition of Trojan Talk. Well, in the military, basic training is known to push people to their limits. And that's exactly what happened on Wednesday when some Troy students got the chance to take their Veterans Day to another level. Ryan Renfro has more. It may have been a day away from class, but for participants in this year's Ruckathon, Veterans Day was a day to take honoring our veterans a step further by stepping into the shoes of those who have served. The Ruckathon is um, it's a relay style race similar to like a Walk for Life where uh, teams of four to six members have one person on the track walking with a military style rucksack. And it's significant just because it gives uh, people that aren't familiar so much with the military a, a chance to you know put on that rucksack even though it doesn't weigh as much as um, our men and women in the military you know are carrying. In their breaks between runs, participants flock to the mini game set up on the side and experience the thrill of battle firsthand. The big one is the clearing house, which uh, we use Nerf guns and um, breach the house like they would do similar to in the military and um, try to kill the enemies in the house. So that's um, always been one of the most popular ones. As you can see, these things are pretty heavy. This one honestly is weighing me down right now. I think it weighs 20 pounds to be exact. So I have no idea how these runners were even able to stay on their feet all day. But behind the running is a cause, a cause that for four long hours pushed the runners past their limits. Canines for Warriors um, provides service dogs for wounded veterans. The really neat thing about them is they don't get their dogs from um, all breeders. They get um, a, the majority of the dogs from uh, local animal shelters. The dog gets a new you know, chance and it also helps the veteran out. So it's a, just a great organization. It's not necessarily for us, but it's for a bigger picture for the United States. You know, it's for Americans, people that we love, people that we represent and we want to protect. And uh, to know that someone has given their lives for us, it only makes me want to go a little bit harder for them. If it's going to benefit veterans at all, you know, I'm, I'm, everything is about you know helping your fellow soldier. And you know, if it benefits a, a good organization, then we're all in. We'll do it every time. Ryan Renfro, Troy Trojan Vision News. 
And in a fun way to celebrate Veterans Day, Choice Freshman Forum held an event that allowed the students to bounce around to raise money for the Wounded Warrior Foundation. Jordan Elston has the details. <laughs> Troy University students had a chance to have some midday fun Tuesday afternoon at Bounce for Veterans. Uh, we're out here having Bounce for Veterans. It's just kind of a thing, you know, Troy's a very military affiliated school. And so uh, we're kind of doing our part in honor of uh, uh, Veterans Day being tomorrow to give back. Uh, we have a uh, giant bouncy slide as you can see here and we've got, uh, we're selling uh, baked goods and uh, it's a dollar each and you can bounce three times for a dollar or you can get one baked good for a dollar and uh, all the proceeds, proceeds are going to uh, Wounded Warrior Foundation. So it's just a really good, really good cause and a really fun event. And what exactly is Wounded Warrior Foundation? Well, it's kind of like a, a program that goes, you know, a lot of people, when you're at war, they get hurt, they get injured, they've got uh, uh, disabilities that really kind of prevent them from going back to living their day-to-day -day life. And so it's just to kind of help them get back on their feet. It gives money to their families while they're not able to work or if, maybe if they're uh, medically discharged, if they're unable to find a job because of their injuries. It kind of helps provide a support for them. It sets up scholarships for their children and different stuff like that just to kind of help uh, help provide the people who have made the ultimate sacrifice for us. Not only is Bounce for Veterans a way to donate money to a good cause, but also for students to de-stress before upcoming finals. It's just kind of a fun way to de-stress, you know. Who doesn't love bouncing on a giant slide? Well, bouncy slides are a lot of fun. I mean, it doesn't matter how old you are, I suppose. It helps out relieving stress especially since finals are coming up. I guess donating a dollar for the veterans isn't really a bad decision either. And before Troy University's football game last Saturday, there was another fundraiser benefiting veterans as Troy for Troops held a, an event that had a pretty large prize falling from the sky. Once again, here's Jordan Elston. It's a bird. It's a plane. No, it's a skydiver. Troy for Troops took a leap, or a pretty big jump, in an attempt to raise money for student scholarships Saturday morning with an event titled The Drop. Um, we have a Troy for Troops committee um, to um, do things for our military, for our students who are in the military, our alums who are in the military. And this year we decided that one of the things we could do, because we have an increasing number of young men and women who are coming back from service, uh, that are here in school and many of them could use some financial aid and so we decided to do the drop. We reprised this event from about 15 years ago when Mrs. Hawkins and I co-chaired the event and we raised money for women's athletics. This year we are raising money for Troy for Troops scholarships for our young men and women who are currently in school and we're also adding some money to our endowed scholarship that we set up a few years ago. The squares were purchased before the event, all for a chance to win a pretty nice prize. You're going to see two parachutists drop out of the air. The first one is just for fun. The second one will be carrying a big American flag so you can tell. The square that he lands on will win uh, a, a prize, $1,000. Um, we sold the squares for $20 each, so collectively we're funding, this year we're funding three um, current scholarships, the rest of the money will go into the endowed scholarship fund, but we hope to get that up to as many as eight individual scholarships. The winner was trustee member Roy Drinkard. We're going to take another quick break. When we come back, we'll hear some offerings from our friends at Troy Public Radio. So don't touch that dial. When I was in foster care, I never knew when I would have to move. So I always had my suitcase ready to go. Then one day I was adopted. My new parents opened their hearts and home to me. My parents cook my favorite breakfast for me every morning. My parents take me on trips I never thought I would go on. They gave me a home and an even better reason to use that suitcase. My parents aren't perfect, but they're perfect for me. This is Thomas. During the day, he works in research. And at night, he's a warrior. Soon he'll have a degree from Troy University, a historic and affordable public university with flexible online and in-class courses, and professors who know their students by name. Do what you love and be great at it. That's the warrior spirit. Learn more at troy.edu slash working warrior. Now back to Troy Trojan Vision News Weekly. Each week we take some time to hear the, some of the work done by our broadcast partners at Troy Public Radio. As we do each week, we'll get another sample of Talk of Troy, the student-produced newscast of Troy Public Radio. 
Let's take a listen. It's the Talk of Troy. Voices and sounds from the campuses of Troy University. I'm Pierce Godwin. Lieutenant Colonel Ed Yielding is a Troy University graduate, a retired Air Force pilot, and a member of the Alabama Aviation Hall of Fame. He also happens to hold the world record for the fastest U.S. coast-to-coast flight, and producer Kenya Taylor has the story. Ed Yielding's record-setting flight happened in March of 1990, when Yielding was asked to fly the plane to its new home in D.C. They said, well, since you're taking off from California, uh, would you mind setting a transcontinental speed record when you bring it to the Smithsonian? Yielding, who made the coast-to-coast trip in an hour and seven minutes, was honored for his accomplishments at the Troy versus Louisiana Monroe game. Even though he was being recognized, Yielding says all veterans deserve our gratitude. Really, I admire uh, and appreciate all servicemen, and whenever I talk to a serviceman, I always uh, thank him for his service. For the Talk of Troy, I'm Kenya Taylor. November 12th marked the first birthday for Troy University's Campus Kitchen. Coordinator Jonathan Seeland assisted in bringing the project to Troy, Pike County, and more importantly, those in need. Campus Kitchens is a national organization of uh, colleges and universities across the nation that work to capture and reclaim unused food and then direct that into the hands of those that are in need. In its first year, the Campus Kitchen at Troy has served over 5,000 meals, and Sealand hopes to see that number increase in the coming years. I would really say like just refining our processes and then continuing to do what, uh, what, what we do. To learn how to join and support the project, search online for Troy Campus Kitchen. I'm Pierce Godwin, and you've been listening to The Talk of Troy, a production of Troy Public Radio. Throughout the week, Troy Public Radio can be heard on 89.9 in Troy and Montgomery, 88.7 in Dothan, and 91.7 in Phoenix City. Well, it's time for our last break. When we return, we'll learn more about Trojan alumnus Ed Yielding's record-breaking flight. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. You make me wear my bike helmet. You taught me never to run with scissors. You tell me to stay away from drugs. To always buckle my seatbelt. And to follow the swimming rules. You're always looking out for me and trying to keep me safe. So why do you keep a loaded gun in your drawer? Here in the garage. Closet. Shoe box under the bed. Where anyone can get to it. How safe is that? How safe is that? How safe is that? You ask them to follow some safety rules. Now they're asking you. In fact, they're counting on you. Never let your gun get into the wrong hands. If you own a firearm and are not using it, please be responsible and be sure that it's stored in a safe place. Remember, always lock it up. For more information on firearm storage safety, visit ncpc.org. Now back to Troy Trojan Vision News Weekly. Earlier in the show, you met Lieutenant Colonel Ed Yielding, who set the all-time cross-country speed record flying across America in less than 68 minutes. In this week's Trojan Talk, Walter Cavan learns the details of that flight from Colonel Yielding. Hello, and welcome to Trojan Talk. I'm your host, Walter Cavan, and I'm Senior Vice Chancellor for Advancement and Economic Development uh, here at Troy University. My guest today is the world's fastest Trojan, Lieutenant Colonel Ed Yielding. And as a fellow Air Force pilot, tremendously proud and pleased to have you with us to tell us a little bit about your world record transcontinental crossing in the SR-71 back in 1990. Thanks for being with us today, Ed. Thank you. Good to be here. Appreciate it. Tell us a little bit about the SR-71 and what made this record possible. The SR-71 was one of America's premier reconnaissance jets for 25 years of the Cold War, starting back in 1964 through uh, 1990. The world's fastest and highest flying airplane, exciting to fly, and I was extremely fortunate to fly it for six years. Then in 1990, uh, Congress voted to retire the Blackbird. The Smithsonian Institution wanted one for display Mm -hmm. after retirement, and they asked us to set a transcontinental speed record when we delivered it from California to the Smithsonian 
and the purpose of the record would be to help call the public's attention to what a great, great airplane it has been for our country for 25 years of the Cold War. That's so uh, JT Vita, my RSO navigator, uh, RSO stands for Reconnaissance Systems Officer. He flew in the back seat of the Blackbird. It's a two-seat airplane, pilot in the front, and then RSO in the back. Uh, we were just in the right place at the right time and asked to, be, to fly that flight from uh, California to the Smithsonian. So they wanted a coast-to-coast -coast record, so we took off at March the 6th, 1990, flew 200 miles out over the Pacific Ocean, air refueled, got a 200-mile running start. <laughs> the NAA, which is the agency that uh, monitors and verifies official records, started the clock when we crossed the West Coast. And then when we crossed the East Coast, they got the time. And the Blackbird had just set a new uh, transcontinental speed record, coast to coast, 67 minutes and 54 seconds. So we, our cruise speed was Mach 3.3, wow. which uh, that is that day, depending on temperature, that day it was about 2,190 miles an hour. So we were faster than a speeding bullet all the way across the United States. And just to clarify, Mach 3.3, Mach 1 is the speed of sound. So you were going over three times the speed of sound when you were going. Uh, That's right. Our flight manual limit was Mach 3.3. We normally did not exceed uh, Mach 3.2, but I had special permission to take it right <laughs> up to the flight manual limit. So that was my cruise speed, Mach 3.3, uh, 2,190 miles an hour, uh, all the way across the country. And what altitude were you flying at as you did this? We <clears throat> climbed to 75,000 feet, and then we did a cruise climb after that. The airplane is more efficient fuel-wise, and fuel was real tight for that flight. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, as we get lighter, we're more efficient being a little hi higher. So we started our cruise at 75,000 feet, gradually climbing, and when it was time to come down, <clears throat> we were at 83,000 feet, and uh, we did a descending left-hand turn as we crossed the East Coast and uh, flew back to uh, Dulles. And tell me, how hot does the skin of the aircraft get at those kind of speeds? Well, <clears throat> you know, uh, near 80,000 feet, the stratosphere is minus about minus 70 degrees Fahrenheit but friction with the air causes the mm -hmm. airplane to get really hot and it averages the skin averages about 550 degrees Fahrenheit so parts of it get much ho hotter than that so Kelly Johnson the uh, famed Lockheed designer uh, designed the airplane uh, and made it primarily out of titanium so it could take that high temperature and he designed <clears throat> in expansion joints in the uh, airplane. So because at that high temperature, the airplane grew in length about four inches during the flight wow. due to the high temperature. And then when it cooled down and land after landing, it would shrink about four, four inches. <clears throat> How did it feel after you landed and you knew you'd set the record? Oh, we were real excited. Uh, we, were very, we knew we were very uh, fortunate to, to fly that record flight. Uh, we climbed out of the airplane, sh shook hands, and <laughs> JT and I did, and we were excited because we had just flown the world's fastest airplane and set some new records, but at the same time, I have to admit, we were feeling sad because that was going to be our last flight in the Blackbird and it would be the last time the Blackbird, that Blackbird would ever, ever fly. And where is that aircraft now? We landed uh, at Dulles, which is just west of uh, Washington, D.C., and it sat out of uh, public view for the next uh, 13 years, and the, the Smithsonian built a new museum at the south part of Dulles Airport called the Udvar Hazy Center, and the airplane is now displayed nicely right in the center of that uh, museum, and that museum opened on the 100th anniversary of the Wright Brothers' first flight, so that was December, opened December the 3rd of 2003. 100 years after the Wright wow. Brothers' first flight. That's great. Well, Ed, thank you so much for being with us. We at Troy University are mm -hmm. very proud of you, well, thank proud you. to call you a Trojan, well, thank and you. we really appreciate your being with us today. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for today's edition of Trojan Talk. And that's what happened on the second week of November 2015. To find out what's happening throughout the week, you can tune in to Troy Trojan Vision News at 5, 6.30, and 10.30, Monday through Friday or anytime by following us on Twitter at Troy TV News.
Also, feel free to like our Troy Trojan Vision News fan page on Facebook to see links to online content from Troy Trojan Vision News. We hope you join us again next week for another edition of Troy Trojan Vision Weekly. Have a good week.